Good morning, everybody. I'm Jennifer Loving, CEO of Destination Home and also a proud board member of San Jose Spotlight. And welcome to Exploring the Systemic Causes of Homelessness, a collaboration today between Destination Home and San Jose Spotlight and in celebration of our Affordable Housing Month. And so before we jump in, I want to thank our sponsors for today, Silicon Valley at Home, the Housing Authority of Santa Clara County, First Community Housing, and PATH. Before we dive in, we want everyone who's with us today to know that we have the Q&A box open. If you have questions that you'd like to ask, pop those into the Q&A and we will get to them at the end of this forum. So systemic causes, what does that mean? Uh, the reason that we're having this conversation is that uh, Many people, too many people, think that homelessness is caused by personal feelings and shortcomings. And, uh, and, and that really is in the face of, of a really robust body of evidence that, that shows that there are very big systemic issues that are contributing to the root of our homelessness crisis. So uh, during our discussion today, we will be asking our esteemed panelists to share their perspectives, their knowledge, their research about why we have so much homelessness in this country and what we can do about it. And as we get started, I'm super happy to introduce our panelists. And what we're going to do is I'm going to share who uh, we're, who I'm with today, and we're going to put full bios in the chat so that you can see more about folks' credentials, but we have Jeff Olivet with us, who's the Executive Director of the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness. We have Tamika Moss, Founder and CEO of All Home. We have Dante Lartique, Founder and CEO of Raising the Bar and Board Chair of the Santa Clara County Lived Experience Advisory Board, and Dr. Margot Cushell, who is the Professor of Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, and the Division Chief and Director for the UCSF Center for Vulnerable Populations and the Director at the UCSF Benioff Homelessness and Housing Initiative. Uh, thanks everyone for being here today and let's jump right in. So first question for everybody. Well, I want everyone to answer, why are so many people homeless in America? Why don't we start with you, Jeff? Uh, thank you, Jen, and uh, what a fantastic panel. I'm, I'm so happy to be here with all of you, uh, old friends and colleagues. Um, I, I think it's important, Jen, first of all, to recognize that homelessness is a societal failure, not an individual one, as you said. And I think it's also critical that we distinguish between root causes and individual risk factors. I think often you ask sort of a, the, the general public, why are so many people homeless? The things that often come to mind are mental illness or substance use or domestic violence. And while those issues uh, intersect with homelessness in, in a lot of ways, they are not the root cause of homelessness. The root causes of homelessness include the in incredible lack of affordable housing in this country, the deep impact of systemic racism that has created a wealth gap of 10 to one from white households to black households, um, the, the deep economic inequalities that keep people trapped in extreme poverty and just the, the stagnation of wages where the money people make doesn't match up with the cost of housing. And, and you all in uh, San Jose and Santa Clara County see that as, as uh, intensely as anywhere in the country. Uh, I think it's also important to recognize that this has been a problem that has been decades in the making. Uh, you know, if you look back at the sweep of the history of this nation, we've seen waves of homelessness before, uh, all the way back to colonial times, but through the, the Civil War period and the Great Depression, the current wave of homelessness that we're in really started in the late 70s and early 80s, and it tracks to a number of public policy failures. It's not an accident that we have homelessness now. In 1970, we had a surplus of affordable housing uh, of about 500,000 units. Now we have a deficit of 7 million units in this country. So you can track the increase of contemporary homelessness with a dramatic decrease in the availability of affordable housing. What, what would you like to add when Jeff talks about that? It's like, it's interesting because we want to make up every reason for people being homeless aside from the fact that there's no affordable housing. Well, first of all, thank you, Jen, and my esteemed colleagues on this panel and all of those who are joining us today. I'm really excited to be in conversation with you all. I think, you know, Jeff has really sort of framed it, right? Like these are systemic issues that, 
uh, undergird what makes the conditions ripe in any community in this nation uh, for people to be unhoused. And I think I just wanted to offer sort of the regional context. So All Home works across the nine county Bay Area. And, you know, it is most evident, I think, of the lack of deeply affordable housing in our region, where you have average rents in some communities across this region, averaging about $3,000 a month, and incomes, particularly for uh, Black, Brown, and Indigenous households, are significantly less than that. We have about a hundred, uh, about a million people across the nine county Bay Area who are earning less than $35,000 a year. And in fact, it's about $17,000 a year uh, for those households when you have rents at that, that, that price point. And so it's a math problem in some ways around what continues to perpetuate folks falling into homelessness faster than we can house them. Um, and so I think it is important to understand that context relative to this crisis. And the other piece I wanted to just emphasize is the, the highly racialized nature of this, of this crisis. You know, Jeff talked about that in his opening remarks, but it's, ex it's extremely acute in the Bay Area where you have, um, you know, communities like San Francisco where um, the Black population in San Francisco has been declining for decades, but it, it's about five or 6% of the general population, but more than 37% of the folks experiencing homelessness in San Francisco are Black. And you see that actually everywhere. Oakland, 70% of folks who are extreme uh, experiencing unsheltered homelessness uh, are Black folks. And so it is not, not an accident um, that so many of our neighbors brothers and sisters who are experiencing this crisis are people of color because of the state sanctioned racialized policies in the way we developed and frankly the the manifestation of that today right like this just wasn't something that um happened in the 50s and 60s these these remnants are still affecting communities today so it's not an either or and i saw that comment actually in the chat but it is context for if we're going to solve this problem we need to be focusing on the root causes in addition to meeting people where they at where they are in their personal lives thank you marco yeah i mean a hundred percent everything that jeff and tamika said um um i think you know it is so interesting that we always talk to mika about like everyone's always talking about substance use and mental health and no and it's like everyone's ignoring the obvious in a city with five percent of people for instance in san francisco who identifies black americans that almost 40 percent of those experiencing homelessness are that's the conversation we should be having about what are the systemic failures. I'm going to use an analogy because I don't think that, you know, rather than trying to add to repeat what Tamika and Jeff said, to try to help distinguish between this concept that we're talking about of what are underlying drivers compared to what are precipitants. Because you're right, people who are homeless are more likely than the general population to experience substance use and mental health disorders. And I want to talk about that in a moment both about sort of the cause effect problem and also the fact that people with substance use and mental health problems can be housed and we've shown it empirically. But I wanna back up a little bit and use this, this um, metaphor, which I really find helpful, which is if anyone's ever been to or thrown a children's birthday party and played the game of musical chairs, you start with 10 kids and 10 chairs, they all walk around, the music stops, you pull away a chair and one kid is left standing. If you're playing musical chair and one of the kids sprain their ankles, is, and is on crutches, and you pull away the chair, they are most likely to be the kid left standing because all the other kids are like diving, right, for those empty chairs. Here's the thing. If you don't pull away the chair, all 10 kids would be sitting. And if you didn't have the kid on crutches, but you pulled away a chair, there still would be a kid left standing. That is one of the ways that I think about disabling conditions. There's no question that having a mental health or substance use disability, which are highly stigmatized, really get in the way of people's um, social relations. They get in the way of um, employment in part because of discrimination and we don't do a good job of sort of integrating folks, all of those things. Those are gonna be the folks left standing. In California, 
California right now, 23 units of housing affordable and available for every 100 extremely low income households. We've pulled away 77 of those 100 chairs. Some people are like crowded in two or three families, but people are going to leak out. That is the problem. The other thing about it is the bi-directional nature. When people are homeless and they are experiencing just you know, sleep deprivation, they're getting assaulted, they're spending every bit of mental energy of where they're gonna get food or where they're gonna sleep that night, they're getting harassed by the police, they're getting all of these things, it turns out that that worsens people's mental health. And it turns out that it's much harder to quit using if you're using, or in fact, we hear time and time again from people that their drinking went way up or they use more methamphetamines to try to stay awake so they didn't get assaulted, right? So it can have this reverse causality, not to mention the fact that as a physician, it makes it much harder for me to provide the treatments we normally treat to control those conditions. And then the last point I'd like to make is, most people with mental health and substance use disabilities are housed. We know in the, in the nation, the places with the highest rates of mental health and substance use problems, because we track these things, is actually Appalachia and the former Rust Belt. They have like five, 10 times higher the rates of um, opioid overdoses than we do in California and by every other measure. Their housing is much cheaper. They have much lower rates of homelessness. It's inverse. The rates of homelessness in the community actually do not track with how much substance use or mental health there were, problems there were, it tracks with how extensive the housing is. And as I think we'll get to discuss later, we've shown empirically, including in Santa Clara County, that we can take the people with the worst mental health and substance use problems and the worst chronic homelessness and house them successfully. So maybe we'll get to that later to show that it's not inevitable at all if you have these disabilities that you have to be homeless. Thank you, Margo. Dante, last word on this. All right, yeah, for me. Yeah. Um, I think, me personally, I think um, it, it comes down to a few things, but I always think from my perspective, at the larger context, it's money and power or control, especially respect to the foster care community. There's no reason why foster youth should be leaving a system of care and then ending up homeless at a high rate, you know? And so for me, when I think about like, what is the root cause? Yes, we can talk about systemic issues. We can talk about um, social economic, you know, um, you know, inequality, we could talk about, you know, so many things. Um, but for me, I think it, it comes down to that. It comes down to control and money. And what happens for foster youth, respectfully, I'm going to talk a lot about foster youth because I came from that community. Um, we're so institutionalized. We never get to make choices for ourselves. Um, you know, and when we move from one system to the next, and we don't have the skill sets to actually go out and survive. You know, when I emancipated, I didn't have a credit score uh, or a good credit. I didn't have rental history and I didn't have adequate amount of income. And so when you look at uh, this ever-changing Silicon Valley and gentrification, I literally almost from the get don't have a, an, I literally don't have a fighting chance. And that is what is problematic to me. And so how do we encourage, educate, and um, really like show young people a pathway, you know, into interdependence or independence um, into adulthood. You know, when we look at our county, for instance, 40% of all of those that are under 25 years old have spent time in, in the foster care system. That is of the homeless population. That is a problem. So for me, that's a gateway to homelessness. So how do we challenge these things? To me, it comes down to parity. It comes down to education. It comes down to helping folks uh, address their, their, their mental health problems and their trauma, right? I, I tell my wife all the time, it's gonna be a lifetime for me to get through some of the things that I've experienced in and out of care. And so how are we addressing those things when we get people housed? And so I think when we all talk about like, you know, is it one thing or another, like someone said in the co uh, comments, no, it's a, it's a host of things. You know, and how do we as colleagues, as, you know, leaders, those that can influence this work, how do we all come together and actually come up with solutions that are viable? And I think in this county, we are doing some of those things, you know. You know, one thing I think about is how we other people who are 
experiencing homelessness. There's this, it's an interesting tendency. Like there's this whole group of people that makes no sense. It's totally different than everybody else. And uh, uh, when we talk about things like, like substance abuse, you think about the things that we know were true during the pandemic. There was all that news about alcohol sales shooting up when people were quarantined, the stress, the anxiety, the fear, like, like, oh, we tried to cope differently. And, 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 and almost like that was like funny, right? But when it comes to people, I mean, imagine on the streets and trying to cope, like, and, and then to think that for some reason people are, are not looking at accessing the same things that literally everybody in the Bay Area who was housed, it's, it's a really interesting dichotomy. Tamika, the answers that we just heard are, are a lot different than, than what we hear in the, in the public square. We hear so much about why people are homeless and, and so much of it is misconceptions and also I think deliberate disinformation. Why is there so much disinformation now uh, about why we have so many people that are on our streets? Well, I, I think that it is challenging for the average person in a community who walks by someone on the street and sees that human suffering to not have an emotional visceral reaction of something being dramatically wrong. And oftentimes because uh, we don't pay attention as much to those systemic issues that we were just talking about, you empathize or sympathize with the person in front of you. Um, and so I understand why the public perceives um, homelessness to be about personal and individual circumstances. And in fact, as the challenges um, that we face get worse, right? We, we've, we saw that in the point in time counts that, you know, homelessness, although, um, you know, in some communities have decreased, others have seen increases. So I, I, I want to just acknowledge that I understand how these misperceptions and, and, and sort of, uh, beliefs, mental models about who the people are come front and center uh, to this conversation. But I think what, what Dante said to me is really powerful, right? Is that people aren't systems. And yet the way in which we try to address the housing crisis of 160,000 people in our state is through a systems response instead of a people-centered response that actually questions how in fact people thrive in their community. You need education, you need housing, you need food, you need access to transportation, you need good schools for your babies. And so there's something about the way that we systematize homelessness, in fact, that disconnects us from the humanity that we all share of being in a region that is the, California being the fifth largest economy in the world. And yet we have the, the second highest unsheltered population in the country on top of the income and wealth disparities that we've already talked about. So to me, it, it really, it's easy for progress and success to be invisible. We house thousands of people a day, a month, a year, right? When I was working at Hamilton Families, we housed thousands of families and children who were able to stay housed, get back into their communities and thrive. But it doesn't, you don't see those successes because folks are actually living their lives and doing the thing. You see the people who are still out there suffering. And so I think it's really challenging for the public to understand how much incredible data informed uh, evidence based work that's happening to address this crisis because of all of the the human suffering in front of us. And so I think it's important for us to push through that initial uh, view of what we think we see and go deeper. It's a really important point because as the point in time counts have come out across the state and in Santa Clara County, our homelessness numbers stayed fairly flat, but we've also permanently housed over 6,000 people in the last two years. And yet the perception is nothing's being done. It's like, whoa, well, but a lot's being done, right? So how do you, how do you connect those, Dante? And I just want to say, with those 6,000 people, we have, a, what, a 91% retention rate? Um, that is super exactly. impressive. And I'm a consumer. Whether I like my provider or not, I've been housed for 10 years, okay? Um, that's another story, though. 
What I want to do, though say is like, what about that 9%, right? And we'll talk about those things, but 91% retention rate is super important, okay? And so folks, when you want information, don't allow fear mongering tactics to dissuade you from what is actually concrete. So Margo, when it comes to public perception, and we've already talked about it a little bit, but two issues keep coming up over and over again, mental health and substance abuse. You've been involved in extensive research, uh, exploring the connections between health and homelessness. Do you see mental health and substance abuse as a root cause for why so many people are homeless? Absolutely not. I mean, full stop, no. And again, I want to distinguish between precipitants and root causes. As I've said, if you look in the regions of the country, it tracks with housing. Um, so that's a really important thing to keep in mind. But the other thing to keep in mind is that we know how to manage mental health and substance use disabilities, just like we know how to manage cancer or heart failure or other diseases or problems that are less stigmatized. Sometimes we do it better, sometimes we do it worse, but we have strategies. All those strategies fly out the window when someone isn't housed. And you could have the best mental health and substance use treatment. And if someone isn't housed, it's not gonna work. And we see that even, you know, if like, if people go to treatment and then they are discharged to homelessness, which if they enter homelessness, they often are discharged to homelessness, one, they relapse, and two, they're still homeless, right? So like, so even if they're sober, they're still homeless. Like you, there is no way getting around this that the solution to homelessness is housing. In Santa Clara County, we started it in about 2015. We um, took on a challenge. This was actually before a lot of the supportive housing was like happening before Jen Destination Home really, you know, leaked into, leaked into full gear. And we were able to fund about 130 units of what's called permanent supportive housing. All this meant was subsidized housing. So the housing was rented sort of by an agency abode, which is fantastic. And only people only had to pay 30% of their income to get into the housing. And we wrapped around services to meet the needs that are appropriate for people with disabilities. And when I think about these services, I think about them as a disability accommodation. Just like if you're a wheelchair user, you're going to want a ramp and an elevator, right? If you have a mental health disability, you might want to have services to help you stay housed. The services were not that extensive as a healthcare provider when we like throw money left and right. It was basically a master's trained uh, counselor. So either a social worker or MFT who worked with a peer and someone with bachelor's training who could serve as a case manager and the peer could serve as a peer case manager. That team of three was assigned 45 clients. So like the social worker had 45 clients, but was assisted by worked in a team with the peer and the bachelor's trained. We went through all of San to Clara's records, and we found the 400 people with the most significant substance use and mental health problems. And they were significant, who were chronically homeless. These were people who had spent on average, um, you know, had on average 15 emergency department visits in the prior two years, four hospitalizations, five jail stays, all of those things, right? They were in and out of jails and hospitals and, and interacting with the police. And we put tags in all of the, in all of the systems. So if they showed up in the ER, it said a flag. If they showed up in jail, it had flag. We didn't go looking for them. And we said, if they come, do us a favor, call this number. And so the team would get calls and they would show up at seven in the morning and meet someone who had been, you know, in the ER all night or in jail all night, not their best moment. And literally what they said to them is, hey, if you sign these 20 pieces of paper, because we need to follow you and we're trying to do this study for 15 years, you have a 50-50 chance of getting housing because we only had 130 units of housing. That's what we had. We had of the about 400 people we approached, we had about three people turn us down, two of whom were not even sure if they were, if they were eligible. Everybody said yes, even though they didn't come to us, we met them at the ER at seven in the morning after they've been up all night. Soon as they said yes, we randomized them. Again, we, we, we didn't try to decline people housing, but we only had a third unit, so we had to do a lottery. So we lotteried them right there. If they were in, it was on us to get them housed. It was on abode, the service that we worked with to get them housed working with this team. When we published the study, 86% of those folks had been housed. By the time we completed it, 91% of those folks had been housed. These are the most impaired people in Santa Clara County. 
We followed them now for seven years. Once they were housed, they stayed housed on average 93% of the nights, meaning that they stayed housed. Like every time they were in the hospital, it counted against them. They stayed housed. We've been following them for seven years. These were the most impaired folks. Were they required to take services? Absolutely not. They were completely voluntary. Did they take advantage of them? Absolutely. We saw that the use of the psychiatric emergency room went way down. The use of outpatient mental health treatment went way up because we made the services easy to get. And I, um, we can do this with the most impaired folks. Everyone else, it's even easier. Yeah. Yeah. Is everything you just described, is that housing first? That is housing first. That is a word that has become bizarrely like a dirty word or something. What housing first says is not housing only, right? It's housing first, meaning you don't say to these folks, hey, you need to go to substance use treatment before you have any chance at housing. Because guess what? Guess what if we had met them at seven in the morning after a night you know, in jail and said, you need to go to substance use treatment before you get housing. I don't think people would have said yes. What we said is here's housing. And by the way, we're going to make it really easy for you to get whatever treatment we want. We're going to take away the barriers. You're going to have this peer who's going to sit with you at the DMV to get your paperwork. We're going to have this peer who will sit with you in the doctor's waiting room. We have a, you know, a case manager who will make you appointments. We'll have a, a, a master's trained behavioralist who, if you want to talk, start talking about your issues and do motivational interviewing, do therapy, you can do it here. Housing first just means that to end homelessness, you need housing and you need to start it without preconditions. But it doesn't mean housing only. It means that for it to work, you have to provide the services that are appropriate to this person's needs. Because these folks had a lot of needs, we provided a lot of services. But I can tell you in terms of costs, not terribly costly. And it's sort of a range of services that's really nothing in terms of the healthcare system, like having that ratio is not that much. It's not that hard to do, but it worked. Housing first, is what we need to do. It is unquestioned. It's not just our study. It's been done across Canada. It's been done in multiple studies in the US. There was a study of people who were like in and out of jail in Denver. Turns out the people offered housing first went to jail a lot less often and they stayed housed. Housing first is the way forward, but it is not housing only. So I hope somebody can pop from on my team pop Margo study in the chat in case people are looking for it. And then I just wanted to ask the rest of the group as a follow on. Why is, has there been so much noise lately about housing first not working? I get told that a lot. Housing first never works. It works 10% of the time. Why is that happening? Again, I think when we talk about uh, fear-mongering tactics, folks are getting misinformation, right? Um, is housing first the only solution? And the all be all, no, not necessarily. However, even for raising the bar, we provide mentorship and housing. At the end of the day, when a young person comes to me, I need to see them in a holistic manner. I need to serve them in that way because I wasn't served that way. And because I wasn't served that way, I fell through the cracks at time. If we're going to cement these cracks, we need to know who's in front of us. And we need to approach them as an individual and instead of this person that fits in a system. <clears throat> and so to me, that's why housing first is super important. If I know a young person needs housing, um, but I also know their biggest issue might be mental health, but not necessarily transportation or education, then I need to allow them to get stably housed and then create a plan around their mental health instead of me putting these parameters around them that they have to uh, be required to do. So again, like folks need to get the information before they start making assumptions. Um, and I always tell people, reach out to me. Hopefully someone on this, you know, uh, behind the scenes can share our contact. I'm always willing to talk to people, invite people to our lived experience advisory board meetings. At the end of the day, if you want information, you got to get it from the sources that are actually putting it out. And you need to talk to folks with lived experience that are experiencing these things. Jen, can I just add, I, I think there are a lot of things at play here. I think um, uh, this has been politicized, you know, that's been uh, turned into, you know, a, a weapon saying, you know, we still have homelessness, therefore housing first has failed as a, as a public policy. And that's misinformation. I think Dante's absolutely right. And you all heard that in, in Margot's uh, full-throated defense of, of the evidence for, for housing first. I think another thing at play is often organizations and communities 
are housing people quickly without scaling up the wraparound supports for mental health and, and primary care and, and substance use treatment and calling it housing first. So essentially saying something is housing first when it's not. And then landlords will say, wait a minute, I've got this person who's having all kinds of psychiatric symptoms and substance use issues and, and this isn't working, therefore housing first doesn't work. So I think sometimes it's a failure of, of labeling that you're doing something that's not actually true to, the, to what the research says. The other, the other couple of pieces of this are that we, we've not scaled up what works. You know, you heard Margot talking about 138 units of housing. We need to be doing that tenfold, 20-fold, 50-fold, 100-fold to keep up with the, the demand for that. And the reality is that people need a lot of different kinds of combinations of support when they're in housing. All of us do, regardless of whether you've experienced homelessness or not. But we've not scaled up those supportive services uh, in the housing, we've also not scaled up the number of housing units. Um, what I've, I've heard, you know, Tamika, your numbers about the, just the thousands of people that you all uh, saw exit homelessness successfully when you were at Hamilton, we see that across the country. In, in Los Angeles every day, more, you know, 206 people are housed, exit homelessness, but 230 become homeless. And across the country, that scales up to about 900,000 people exiting homelessness uh, each year. But over the last two or three years, it's been 920,000, 930,000 becoming homeless. So you got to scale up the stuff that works and you've got to turn off the faucet. You know, we haven't talked yet in this conversation about prevention, but to say that housing first is a policy failure is, is like saying uh, Advil doesn't work because we still have headaches or emergency rooms don't work because we still have gunshot wounds or, or automobile accidents. It's, it's illogical. It's bad analysis. It also, it's so interesting to me, Jeff, I mean, this issue has become so politicized and I, and I think part of it is the stigmatization of these disabilities. The second thing is the racism. I'm just going to, as a white woman here, I'm going to call it out, right? This, is, this problem stems from racism. It's not going to be solved until we address historic injustices and, 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 and that's it and that's keeping us. The other thing is housing is more expensive in sort of knowledge economy areas with a lot of income inequality. Those tend to be blue areas. It's become a fantastic fantastic wedge issue because you can look at these blue areas and say, oh, it's it's the problem of, you know, whatever. So that gets in the way of solving it. I also just want to point out to the group, it's so interesting. We have something that knows that works. We don't scale it. Um, in what other thing, like I think, you know, if you had like hunger, right, you wouldn't want to do a study to show that food solves hunger. That's pretty obvious. But we've sort of been forced to do these studies because no one believes us, right? But then you give like five pieces of bread for a hundred people and they're still hungry. And then what we say is bread, food doesn't work to solve, to solve hunger. Instead of saying, we're not giving the right food and we're not giving enough of it. We need to actually spend some money and do the right thing. And I think it's really getting in the way of getting us to solutions. And we're really backing up against like we're, we're fighting this battle to sort of state the obvious housing solves homelessness. You know, I think part of it is because homelessness is a, a community health crisis. It's sort of everyone feels, or many people feel like they're a subject matter expert on homelessness because it's something that we see on a daily basis. I mean, people without any expertise write books, write tweets, they, they, they have opinions without research data analysis. And, and I think that is part of what contributes to furthering the divide. Uh, but let's talk a little bit more about the economics. So Tamika, uh, tell us why All Home believes that homelessness starts with a lack of support and economic mobility for extremely low income households and also maybe uh, help us understand what does extremely low income household, what does that mean? Yeah, it's a great question, Jenna, and I um, think about this a lot because when I decided to start All Home, it was really out of recognizing how housing security and economic security are inextricably linked. You know, we would work with families to increase their household incomes. And in some cases, they would do that over the course of the rental subsidy period that they were receiving uh, 50%. They'd get 50% more income over a two year period and still not have enough income to uh, meet their basic needs, including housing costs. And so, mm -hmm. We can't live in a society where wages have declined or been stagnant. 
for decades, particularly for earners in this extremely low income category where they're, and it, it varies by community, but on average, a household of three is earning about $35,000 a year. Even two earners at minimum wage are still unable to afford the housing costs in, a, in addition to other household needs. And so, as I said earlier, the math problem, we need to be fighting for competitive living wages for people in our community to be able to afford housing and all of the other basic needs that they have. We need to be asking our companies about how are we creating pipelines of opportunity, talking to our labor partners? Where do we increase the, the economic security and mobility for the bottom third of our economy? That's how you get to address the economic volatility for really poor people in the region. I often, I'm from Cleveland originally, and I often talk with my family about this, right? Where my auntie in 2011 bought our house for $85,000. It's a four bedroom house with a finished basement. It's fabulous. Um, and she works a job that pays her $18 a, a, an hour and is able to afford her mortgage. We do not have those economic conditions in our region. And so how do we meet the gap where the economy is producing uh, low wage work, low quality work, yet astronomical housing prices. And one of the other uh, data points that I often communicate in these conversations is between 20, 2000 and 2010, the Bay Area produced 440,000 new jobs across the region. 55,000 units of housing were built during that same period of time. Okay, where do people gonna live? Even if you are a high wage earner, that means you're taking over housing that is affordable to people with lower incomes because that's the only housing that's available. We have not kept up, talk about scale. Uh, if you look at how we the region produces housing, we do a count of that through our regional governance body, um, ABAG and MTC, that looks at the regional housing allocation goals. And we do that by income, right? So low income housing to, to high income housing. We have never produced enough extremely low income housing in the region to keep up with demand. And so unless we start to look at the equation and policy choices that look at both economic stability and wellness for people and housing costs, we're missing the mark. So, and, and to that end, since we're the most expensive region in the nation, a lot of times we hear, well, if you can't afford to live here, you should just move. So Jeff, you know, you have a much broader perspective. Does that work? The, I think it's important to recognize that homelessness is everywhere in this country. It is an urban issue, a suburban issue, a rural issue, a tribal issue, a red state issue, a blue state issue, a coastal issue, a middle America issue, a north south issue. Having said that, uh, there are places where the circumstances are more complicated, where the economics, uh, the, the kind of economic forces are are tougher. Um, and what that determines is kind of the, the scale and scope of homelessness. Um, the other thing that we know, every study I've ever seen uh, that, that looks at where homelessness comes from is that the vast majority, in most cases, 80 to 85% of homelessness happens within the folks who live in that community or, or very nearby. And everywhere has this myth that folks are just flocking here because of our great shelter system or our great services or our great weather or our great, uh, you know, you name it. And it's just never true. I mean, there are some, maybe some, uh, some very few exceptions to that. Um, so, I, you know, I think the, the reality is that we have to recognize that this is a national crisis that has hotspots. Think of it like COVID, uh, especially the early days of the pandemic, where uh, it's something that can happen anywhere. And we see some places spike differently at different times for different reasons. And it's, it's not exactly parallel to that, but it's, it's a, a, I think, a useful uh, metaphor. The fact that we don't have a great read on real-time data at any given point makes it very, very hard to know where to target resources. So we kind of throw out a lot of resources kind of more or less equally to, to communities based on per, per capita numbers, but not necessarily targeting it where the problem is most severe. Uh, Jen, it's a hard question. You know, if somebody left 
uh, San Jose today and went to Cleveland where Tamika grew up or Tuscaloosa, Alabama, where I grew up, would their, um, their prospects for exiting homelessness be better or worse? There are so many factors that go into that question, uh, you know, that are economic, that are some of the personal risk factors and precipitants that, that we've talked about. Um, but the reality is uh, homelessness targets every geography in this nation. It just does it differently. Uh, we have not created a society that takes care of each other very well. And, and that, that sort of lack of, of compassion, the lack of a safety net, the lack of investing in housing as a human right has created the circumstances where we see massive homelessness now. But we would be remiss if we didn't also talk about the years and decades of disinvestment, federally, statewide, locally, Margot. How does uh, disinvestment into our social safety net uh, contribute to rising homelessness? Yeah, I think it's really important, and and I think it's important also to 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 talk about the federal disinvestment. You know, I feel like mayors and governors get hammered on this issue, and we often let our federal partners off the hook, and they probably for one because they don't need to balance the budget, unlike it's local and state government, um, but also because of the scale of the problem. Um, it is the heart of this problem. You know, we have had just a real change over the past few decades in investments in things like affordable housing. And someone asked a great question, what do we mean when we say affordable housing? And I'm glad that they asked that. I mean, I think, you know, the federal government sort of says something is considered affordable if, if a household can pay 30% or less of their income to live there. You'll also hear this term extremely low income. Those are households that make less than 30%. It's sort of a coincidence that those are the same numbers, so it's confusing, but less than 30% of the median income of the area in which they live, which is different in Tuscaloosa than it is in San Francisco. It's obviously a much higher number in San Francisco. But to give you a scale of the problem, most people who become homeless come from that group with lower incomes. In California, we have a million units too few that that population of people could actually afford on 30% or less of their income. And if they're spending more than 30% of their income and you're in that extremely low income category, you're not putting away any money for a rainy day, you're not paying for food, you're not paying for healthcare, you really need every ounce of the rest of the money for the other things. Um, I think though, like there are a few things that people should keep in mind. Not only have we not invested in the construction of new housing, which is really expensive and it needs to be done. And for low income renters, they can't actually pay an enough rent to cover the ongoing costs. So it's going to need a subsidy to help build it. That subsidy needs to come from the federal government. But we've really, really cut back on what we do to support people with low incomes to help them pay their rent. Only one in four households who meet the very strict requirements to get any rental assistance from the federal government, which is where most rental assistance comes, get it. Think about it. Can you imagine a system of like Medicaid, which is health insurance for the poor, where we said, oh, you meet all the requirements, but sorry, Johnny and Susie and Billy are ahead of you. So wait about 10 years and we'll try to get you on it. It's really only for rental assistance that you can meet the requirements and still not get it. And most people don't get it. Only a one in four households who qualify get it. There's a lot of good research. You know, there's lots of problems with housing vouchers. These are colloquially called Section 8, you might have heard, called Housing Choice Vouchers or Public Housing, which is slightly different, but the same idea. Um, you might have heard all the problems. Lots of people in California sort of need assistance and don't qualify because our housing is so expensive. Lots of times in, in places like California where the market's really hot because of discrimination, there's just a great New York Times article about discrimination in New York against it. Voucher holders are discriminated against and can't cut housing. Even putting aside all of those things, fundamentally, only one in four people who qualify get it. That makes it very hard to solve this problem. Great research, for instance, on family homelessness, that if you just give families who are living in shelters a voucher, their homelessness ends much better than any other inter intervention we could do. We just don't have the vouchers and really only the federal government because of the way taxes are set up and everything could do this. They could fix it overnight if Congress agreed to it. So Jeff, why aren't we fixing this overnight? There is such an obvious connection between when the federal government throws its weight at a social problem and how it gets solved. Uh, after our last huge spike in homelessness in this country back into the 1930s with the Great Depression, 
the federal government invested hugely in public housing, in affordable housing, in home ownership. It was racially inequitable. These were the days of redlining. You know, it was, it was a mixed bag of, of public policy. But the reality was coming out of the Great Depression and World War II, the federal government led the way on, on affordable housing. Starting in 1972, if, the, if you look at the 20 years after that, across Democratic administrations and, and Republican administrations, federal investment in affordable housing was slashed by 80%. And it's in that period that you can see the current spike in contemporary homelessness that laid the, the groundwork for where we are now. Um, in the president's budget, for, for this coming year, the proposed budget for FY23, there are more than 200,000 vouchers being proposed. Uh, President Biden and Vice President Harris in Build Back Better, which did not pass through uh, the Senate, uh, proposed $150 billion in affordable housing and homelessness related activities, and Congress um, failed to pass that. Even so, this administration has put a tremendous amount of resources into the field. If you look at the uh, infusion of emergency housing vouchers, home, uh, home dollars through the American Rescue Plan, the emergency rental assistance dollars that staved off what many uh, predicted would be a tsunami of evictions over the last two years, those resources are working. You know, if not for those resources, co the, the COVID pandemic would have resulted in probably a doubling of people experiencing homelessness in America. So we, I, I don't want folks to, to sort of sit by and, and, and say, you know, the federal government's doing nothing on this. I think the last couple of years have shown that a very robust muscular uh, leadership by an administration can begin to make a difference. But we're trying to make up for 40 years of policy that not only disinvested in housing, but slashed the social safety net for families and, and uh, created welfare to work programs. And it's, it's a bipartisan failing. Let's be real about that too. A lot of people will point to the Reagan administration and say Reagan slashed the safety net, which is true. Bill Clinton passed welfare reform. And, and if, you, if you watch the trends in homelessness, it does not track neatly um, to, to Democrat or, or Republican leadership. This is a bipartisan failure and it's gotta be a bipartisan solution to, to fix. Uh, you ask why we haven't solved it overnight. Uh, Congress needs to move on this. There is no question about it. Uh, we need a massive infusion of federal resources into affordable housing and wraparound supports in this nation. It really speaks, you know, when you talk about 80% decline, the, the, this is a society that isn't caring for each other, isn't caring for the most vulnerable, certainly not caring for its children. Uh, Tamika, at the state of California, we had something called redevelopment, that went away. What's the what's the investment with the state? Yeah, it, I just wanted to you know put a finer point on on what Jeff and Margo said about when the federal government does get involved. That's when you get scale. Uh, when the Obama administration started to focus on veterans homelessness, we saw federal resources being deployed where there were vouchers, services, and political will those these three things in combination and some jurisdictions cut veterans homelessness in half and others got to functional zero so we know that the federal government not only when they when they get involved we can do big policy changes at scale in in our states and counties and cities where we now lay the burden of addressing homelessness and housing insecurity at their feet uh, they have uh, inadequate tools. Uh, in 2012, then Governor Jerry Brown um, eliminated redevelopment, which was a tool that, you know, um, provided tax increment funding for jurisdictions to produce affordable housing. And we've been talking about what that is. That's housing for people with zero uh, incomes all the way up to 80% of the area median income. When that benefit, and that was producing about a a billion and a half to two billion dollars a year for communities across the state to produce affordable housing. When that benefit went away, jurisdictions have had to go it alone. Uh, we have basically had to see measures like Measure A in Santa Clara County, other communities around the, the state and region trying to generate revenue to fund deeply affordable housing for people exiting homelessness and those with extremely low incomes. We're never going to get there. 
let's be clear. The way that we were able to stave off what Jeff was just talking about, we saw this directly in the point in time counts over the last three years. The way we were able to stave off a wave of homelessness and deep and, and the tsunami of evictions was federal infusion of resources that was that came to the state and was then deployed to counties and cities across the state uh, and across the country, frankly. So it is it is nearly impossible for us to not have all levels of government working in partnership with our private sector, our, our philanthropic sector, and frankly, our communities. As, as Dante said, the people who are actually experiencing this crisis, all of those stakeholders actually need to come together, put their assets to work, and try to scale up uh, the interventions that we know work. Otherwise, we are we are not ever going to get to the place where we all believe is possible, which is where house homelessness is rare, brief, and non-recurring. That you we talk about all of the levers that have to be pulled. Um, and and then a, another critical component of this is what do people with lived experience actually need and want and feel and how are they part of the solution? And Dante, you have been so outspoken about how decision makers are not adequately engaging people with lived experience when developing strategies to address homelessness. How has that dynamic contributed to what we're seeing today? Well, first, I just want to say there are a lot of great questions in the chat. Please put your questions in the Q&A. Um, hopefully we can get to some of those. Jen, at the very end of this, can you please explain to folks what affordable housing is, low-income housing, and extremely low-income housing, because there's this misconception, and people do not know. Uh, but it's very important that you all know, and I'm glad that it's recorded. Now, to your question, <clears throat> we have decision makers, a lot of times political leaders, EDs for nonprofits, foundations, whoever, people that move things, control things. At the end of the day, <clears throat> when you do not have representation from my community, folks from the unhoused or the foster care community or whatever community that is being served, when there's not representation, how can you actually make a decision for me that will impact my life? And then when it does not work out, you blame or you you point fingers or you say, well, we waste, we, we invested this money and now we got to go back to the drawing board. At the end of the day, I'll say this, to the last breath I have on this earth. Anytime there is a group of underrepresented folks, you have to put them at the center of whatever the problem is and also whatever the solution is. If you do not do this, you are remiss and you should not be doing this work. And I'll tell that to anyone, period, point blank. At the end of the day, we created the Lived Experience Advisory Board, not because someone wanted to tokenize us or someone to want it to look good. We went to Destination Home, and when I say we, I would be remiss if I don't mention his name. Anthony King went to Destination Home and said, we would like to do this and we would like your support. Whether or not they supported or not, it was gonna get done because this wave has been coming. This is a movement, it's not trendy, and I, I do not like the fact that folks have made it trendy. At the end of the day, you gotta put us at the center of the, 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 the equation, if you don't, someone like me, I created my own. I do not think that we need to create uh, just another organization uh, that fits into the system, right? Again, we have to disrupt things. For me, this is why I say people first, data and program second. At the end of the day, this is someone from my community. This is my family. This is who I've chose. And I'm here today, folks, and I just took my cousin off of life support, who was a homeless man for many years, who was someone that had to navigate? And I'm here because I believe in the power of people. I believe that we all need to understand that collectively you can be allies, but folks with lived experience have the solutions. And I will give you an example of that. Foster care informally, I was a downtown kid for a lot of years. Foster kids have informally always taken care of each other. My wife is on here, she'll tell you how many times I risk my housing before we have kids to let folks from my community sleep on my couch, take a shower, eat, whatever it might be because we take care of each other. Informally, that's how it's been. And now formally, I've just said, you know, enough is enough. The system is failing us. We need to focus on community. 
And now the government and others need to support that. Don't, don't tokenize it, right? You need to support that. And if you don't support it, then, you know, for me, we'll just continue to create our own tables. Jeff, I'm gonna ask you to, I, I know that the lived tech is something that you're super passionate about, but I also would like you to, so I'm hoping that you can answer that also in, in conjunction with uh, something that we worked on together before you were in your current role, which is really the growing body of research that is really definitive about homelessness disproportionately affecting people of color. How do we see the connection between systemic racism and homelessness and, and, and how is the federal government addressing these inequities? Let me first address the lived experience question, tie it to the racial equity question, and then um, give you a preview of our forthcoming federal strategic plan. I think that's how I'll, I'll respond as quickly as I can, Jen. Uh, I, I first had the honor of meeting Dante probably almost four years ago, Dante, I think, three or four years ago, in late 2018 maybe, uh, and was just so blown away by the work that Dante's done, that the Lived Experience Advisory Board has done there in Santa Clara. And we've seen this all over the country where um, people with lived experience are, are not just sort of waiting for an invitation to the table, but are demanding a seat at the table and transforming the system. Uh, I've seen this with youth action boards around communities that have gotten um, youth homelessness demonstration grants and have been required to put together a youth action board. I've seen other communities where young people said, uh, this system isn't working for us, we need you to hear us now, um, and, and really become um, uh, involved in, in real power sharing around how programs run and how systems work. In the mental health recovery movement, there's a statement that goes, nothing about us without us. Uh, you should not be sitting in a room talking about us without us in that room with you. And it, you know, it would be a little bit like um, a bunch of folks who have never had HIV sitting around deciding what should be done with HIV positive people. It would be a little bit like a bunch of men sitting around deciding what women should be able to do with their bodies. This, this messed up, right? And yet we've done this in homelessness decade after decade after decade, where it's people who've never experienced homelessness, and I'll put myself in that category, who are sitting behind closed doors making decisions on behalf of folks who have. And that's we got to stop. That's not that that it hasn't worked. That we've not designed systems or programs uh, that are informed by, or shaped by, or decided by people who are closest to the problem. As Brian Stevenson at, at Equal Justice Initiative says, we've got to get proximate to the problem. I can only get so proximate to the problem. Dante is proximate to the problem in a way that I will never be, and we've got to come together in solidarity to do that. Around racial inequity, um, Tamika talked about this beautifully uh, earlier, Margot did as well. Um, it is no accident that people of color in this country are dramatically more likely to experience homelessness. If you just look at the numbers, at the research, black people and Native American people are at the highest risk of homelessness of, of any racial or ethnic groups. There are other groups, I mean, Latino people in some communities are overrepresented, sometimes under. If you break down the Asian, category, some, some groups are overrepresented, some significantly under, but it is no accident. It is the result of decades of public policy that have made it so. And what I believe is that if the structural racism that has driven high rates of homelessness for people of color was designed by people, then we can design something better. And we're a long way from it. We've got a very long way to go, um, but until we're able to name the problem with precision, to talk about it with courage and to put focused solutions in place to address racial inequities in our homelessness realities across this country, then we're never gonna be able to do it. Colorblind solutions haven't worked for 50 years and they're not gonna start working now. In our forthcoming federal strategic plan to prevent and end homelessness, there will be a strong push around power sharing with people with lived experience. There will be a strong push around racial equity. And you know, sometimes groups uh, question, you know, we're doing a strategic plan. Should racial equity be a principle or a theme or a, 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 a pillar or a strategy? It should be all of those things. And in our plan, you're gonna see it as a guiding principle and commitment of this administration. You're gonna see it as a standalone pillar that focuses very strongly, not just on racial inequity, but on LGBTQ equality, on anti-discrimination against people with disabilities and you're gonna see it woven through all of the other strategies as well. So racial equity and lived experience will be 
here, there, and everywhere in the plan that's going to come out later this year. So we have one more question, and then we want to get to the Q&A, because there are a lot of great questions popping into the, the Q&A. And this has been a really important discussion about the true root causes, and also, frankly, describing a system on every level that is working as exactly as it's been designed to not serve uh, people that are most vulnerable in our community. So if that's true, and if, Jeff, what you said about how these things have been intentional, what uh, types of policies, actions, what do we need to do to address this? What is the change that we need to seek? Let's do a round robin. Let's start with Tamika. And then after we answer this, we'll go to Q&A. Well, I, I, I guess I would just start by saying we need to believe that we can solve this problem at scale. I think one of the, the biggest hurdles we have is when we think that this is an intractable, normalized scenario in, in our communities across this nation. We have to refute the status quo and believe that if we do the things that we've been talking about this hour, that we're gonna be able to address this crisis at scale. The second thing I'd like to say is, All Home has been working with jurisdictions across the region to really look at the solutions of permanent housing, interim housing, and prevention. We believe that if you can invest in each of those interventions simultaneously based on the population of folks in your community who need each of those interventions wherever they are in their housing crisis, that's how we will begin to see a reduction in those experiencing homelessness, increasing the number of permanent housing um, homes and units that we have available, but also looking at those who are most at risk of experiencing homelessness to address that inflow that we've been talking about. We can, Jeff said it, you got to turn off the spigot. We cannot continue to have the, 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 the um, ground that is fertile for more people to fall into homelessness faster than it is for us to house them and expect that we're going to get a hold of this crisis. So I think the policies and, and strategies that are proven by data, allow the professionals who do this work to do their jobs, give them the resources that they need at the scale that they need them. You can't piecemeal solutions to the most significant social issue of our time and then blame the people who are most marginalized in our community for the failure. It is our society's failure and it is our society's job to fix it. Top that, Dante. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, what I will say is, um, you know, folks in the chat, I really appreciate what you're talking about. I always tell folks the system was designed and is working as it was intended to uh, because it wasn't created for my black or my, my brown brothers and sisters' bodies. Um, at the end of the day, for me, when we talk about solutions, it has to be rooted in lived experience. It has to be rooted <laughs> in community approaches um right now we know that you know grassroots organizations typically led by people of color are getting pennies on the dollar to our white counterparts um to serve our community and that's just blasphemy to me at the end of the day uh whether i got the credential or not from that fancy institution or not is not the point if i'm getting outcomes and i'm serving my people the way that i know how you should be funding it you know these are people uh, funds. This is tax funds. This is, you know, um, all of this stuff is is man made. You know, these social constructions are going to continue to hold us back if we don't take our heads out of you know what, right? And at the end of the day, <clears throat> it's just sad that we generation after generation are talking about the same thing, right? From when I was 19, I'm hearing the same conversations around housing. When I was 24, 25, it's the same conversations. Folks need to understand like this is this is something that has happened and is going to continue to happen until we stand up and unite together. And I tell Jen Loving and Destination Home Crew and the CLC, all these folks, put your money where your mouth is. Stop talking about it, be about it. That is true. Marco? Yeah, I mean, I, I big ups to both what Tamika and Dante just said, and it's hard to top that. I mean, I think we need to scale the solutions to the problem. We need to put the power 
in the people who are most central to the problem. And we need to not get distracted by these sort of conversations that are trying to re-wage the war on drugs and that are not trying to re-up you know, institutionalization of people who can live in the community. That is not to say that people don't have severe mental illness. It's just to say, we know how to treat people with severe mental illness and have them thrive in the community and they have every right to do so and every ability to do so. We can't do it if we don't have the housing. It's gonna take a lot of focused attention it's gonna take resources. Every level of government has a role in this. Local government has a lot of control over zoning and we're not gonna fix this problem. If we have a bunch of people blocking every attempt to build every type of housing, we're gonna to need to get local government involved, particularly around zoning issues. We're gonna to need to get state government involved. They have a lot to do around how we design Medicaid or whether they even offer Medicaid because that is something that can be used to really scale up the supports that as we've talked about housing first, not housing only. People do need supports. They need supports. Everybody needs different kinds of supports, right? So we need to scale it up. But mostly we need to have a massive reinvestment in producing, preserving, protecting housing. And for our ELI households, who are the households who are most at risk of homelessness, who are disproportionately people of color because of systemic racism, which by the way, kept them out of the housing market, right? That's how systemic racism works. It denied people of color the ability to own houses for generations, which is why one of the main reasons there's such a wealth gap. And by the way, if you own your house, you can have any family member you want live there. And if you rent, you can't, right? So we need to undo that damage by investing, by realizing that housing is not a commodity, that housing is the single most important thing that we can do to create a thriving community and to recognize that we all win when our neighbors are housed. We all benefit when our neighbors are housed. Business benefits, everybody benefits when our neighbors is housed, but it's gonna take some money to do it, that money has to come from the federal government, but we all need to do our part at whatever level we're in and to not be distracted by the noise. We know how to do this. Yes, there are people with mental health and substance use problems. Guess what? I'm a doctor. We know how to manage those problems. We cannot manage those problems when people are living on the street. So let's get all in on looking for real solutions and let's bring them to scale. We can't give pennies on the dollar, give them as Dante says to the wrong people and then expect the solution to go, this problem to go away. Jeff, final word, and then we'll go to Q and A. Lead with equity go upstream and prevent homelessness from ever happening in the first place. Treat the crisis in front of us like the public health life and death emergency that it is and scale up the housing and supportive services solutions that we know work. I'm just going to say you four would make a heck of a cabinet on this Let's issue. Do it. Let's do it. Okay. So uh, Nick, uh, let's go to Q&A. Uh, uh, can you ask uh, some of the questions that we can hopefully spend the next 15 or so minutes? And then for the panelists, um, I'll either point it your way or just jump in if, you, if you're interested in answering that question. Sounds good, thanks, Jen. Hi, everyone, Nick, editor with San Jose Spotlight. Um, the first question I think we should touch on, it's been brought up a couple times in the chat, and I think Jeff might have even addressed it very briefly, but Dante, because you brought it up, I'd like this to be first. What is affordable housing? How is it defined? And is that just another word for subsidized housing? So I won't speak to affordable housing, I'll let Jen do that, but for me, ELI, ELI housing um, is what we are most focused on, and that has to do with really what you wrap around folks. You know, it's for those that are in most need. I am actually considered an ELI housing, um, you know, tenant. Me and my family of almost six, we make well under that threshold of that 30%. Um, living in Santa Clara, the city of Santa Clara is not uh, cheap to live in, but at the, it stands for extremely low income housing. And I have a family of five. My wife is pregnant. We make less than $75,000 a year. So we are a part of that in the thick of the thick. That's why I don't leave my housing also though, because I don't want to be traumatized by being homeless again, right? At the end of the day, affordable housing is very different to me. You know, I think it's very different. And I'll let Jen touch on that because I, I don't I don't qualify for affordable housing as it stands right now. 
Tamika, break it down, demystify uh, <laughs> area median income. Uh, area median category. income. So afford, I, I think the question is a good one. Um, affordable housing typically does mean that there is uh, an income ban on who can actually live in the housing. Typically, um, there are affordable housing is financed by uh, tax credits, which provide, uh, they're, they're basically um, tax credits that are put out on the, on the private market and then the developers who develop affordable housing are able to purchase those tax credits through the state to pay for and finance affordable housing. So that it's basically a, a financing tool that then has uh, uh, re uh, restrictions on the affordability levels of people who can live there. So typically it, it um, houses folks who are earning zero to 80% of the area median income. Uh, sometimes it can go up to 120% depending on the jurisdiction, but, um, but that's typically uh, the, the income restrictions. The other thing about affordable housing is that it's deed restricted. It, it, it allows the housing units to be affordable for the lifespan of the building. Usually it's a 55 year term um, that has to be renewed actually, which I think it's kind of crazy. You have affordable housing co covenants on your property that should be affordable to people with those incomes in perpetuity, but that's actually not how the financing works. You have to reapply uh, those covenants to the property, but yeah, it, it is a subsidy. Um, but the fact of the matter, just to the, to the person's question, most ELI households across the state of California live in unsubsidized housing. So in fact, they don't, and it's primarily rental housing. So a lot of people with those extremely low incomes from zero to 30% of the area median income, depending on where you live, those folks are living in market rate housing. So they have, are more than 50% of their incomes, oftentimes 80% of their incomes are paid toward rent. So when we talk about the affordability crisis, one of my former colleagues, when I worked in the city of Oakland, used to call affordable housing, housing that you can afford at your income level. And so I think it's an interpretation, but that's sort of the tech, technical framework of how affordable housing is financed um, in, in, the, in California. And I think uh, uh, just to add one point to that, as you go lower down the income earning levels, extremely low income, zero to 30% of area median income is the type of housing that gets built the least. Exactly. And it's impossible to build that level of affordability without subsidy. So when you have people developing affordable housing, uh, it will never naturally occur in the market. We will never naturally build housing because it just doesn't pay for itself. So it requires uh, resources in order to make that work, which is why in Santa Clara County, the Measure A bond has been so important. It was a $950 million bond with most of that money going to build extremely low income housing. That bond passed in 2016 and there's already 41 projects for extremely low income households uh, in Santa Clara County that are underway in development. And prior to 2016, we only had a couple hundred units that were dedicated. And so changing this uh, uh, is, is for us years just in Santa Clara County and that production has to happen everywhere. And, and, and I would say the ironic part about it, uh, to Tamika's point, is that a lot of people are living in, or they are ELI, but they're living in fair market units. For me, that's why I don't give up my housing, because I am ELI, and the biggest benefit for those that are living in it is it typically comes with some type of supportive services, where you can learn how to build the skill sets and the resources that are going to help you transition out maybe one day, right? That's the idea. And I think when, when folks want to know, like, what's the benefit of Housing First ELI, these are the benefits is if we actually tap into what the resources are and are available, young, uh, not young people, people can find upward mobility, but it has to be something that we value, you know, um, but yeah, appreciate it. Nick, what else? Okay, let's get another question. Um, what can we do to convince our friends and neighbors that housing first is the answer? Who wants to take that? 
I was just going to say this because I saw this earlier and I was just thinking about it. Um, it's not the only answer. It is a big part of the answer. And what you can do is uh, get them the information, you know, and if you need information, hit us up, right? We have research that shows, and I'm not, a, believe me, you don't know me yet, but if you get to know me, I'm not a big firm believer in data first, right? Like a lot of people are, I'm more people centered first, community first. That's just my nature, um, just because of my past. But at the end of the day, there there is research and data that shows like, you know, we have a 91% retention rate, right? We have, you know, this supportive uh, services network, this, uh, you know, um, you know, coordinated entry, you know, system. It's not perfect, but it is operating and we can, we can, uh, you know, address some things that need to be like refined, if you will. But at the end of the day, you have to come to folks that have the information that you need and those that are consuming it. I'm a consumer. Come to our lived lived experience advisory board meeting, um, reach out and I'll give you the information. You can see who is on our board and what types of services they, they get and how they're navigating. At the end of the day, systems navigation is super important. That's what I was gonna say is folks with lived experience can help with that, right? I can show my peers how to tap into their supportive services and to utilize it the best way that they possibly can. So that's what I would also like to do for my neighbors, you know, is let them know, you know, what this is. Jeff, what can local communities do to uh, uh, grow the housing first strategies that the federal government really brought to us uh, 20 or so years ago now? I think the, the different audiences need different things, right? Some people are gonna listen to stories, some people are gonna listen to data, some people aren't gonna listen at all. Um, and some people are gonna twist um, twist things for political use. I think, you know, when you think about how social change happens, you bring along people who are most, um, most bring alongable first. The, Everett Rogers talks about this as the, the, um, uh, the, the kind of innovation curve. You bring along those who are like most kind of curious and open and, and arm them with the facts, arm them with the stories, help them understand this if they're really curious. I think we've got to do a better job than messaging our stories, the stories of, of real people who have been really uh, helped by housing first approaches to bring along the kind of early majority and late majority of people who, who are maybe curious. And I think the people who are just, you know, flat out anti housing first, we've got to be louder and more persistent and smarter and more um, more durable in our arguments than they are in theirs. And, and you know, I, I'm not sure we're going to bring everybody along, but if we can shore up the elected officials who kind of think this might work and we need to keep keep on track with it. I think, you know, uh, focus some energy there. I think around neighbors and, and friends and general public, uh, the stories, as Dante was saying, the stories are gonna be much more powerful than any of the, the numbers or data or percentages uh, ever will be. And I think we just gotta keep at it. I, I mean, this is, we are in real danger right now of losing the messaging battle around housing first, around harm reduction, around some stuff that really works, that is uh, grounded in evidence and grounded in research. And I think we've got to kind of regroup and rethink how we're talking about this. So I think there is a, a narrative shift that's that's um, moving in the wrong direction right now. And, and as a movement, I think we need to regroup and rethink how we're telling the story. I think, Jeff, it's, it's interesting to like watch the chat. I mean, I don't think that we do any um, favors like you know yes there are people with mental health and substance use we are not denying that like we are not denying that there are people who are going to need assistance but but lots of people need assistance right lots of people need assistance and we know how to do that we just can't do it without the housing and then there's the stories that are so important and then there's like the proof is in the pudding like the veterans administration has followed housing first principles to a T, but they, because of political will and in, in support of veterans, um, which is a great thing, um, they've been able to fund it. And while homelessness in every other community has gone up over the last few years, homelessness around veterans has gone down by half because they've sort of like stayed with the message, they've done housing first and, and, it's, and it works. And so I think it depends, someone asked what their neighbors needed. Some neighbors are gonna listen to stories, some neighbors are gonna listen to data. And I also think we need to be empathetic and compassionate to people's distress around seeing people with obvious mental health or substance use problems. Like on this, that is true, they are there, but, but we can't help them without the housing. It's gotta start with the housing. 
And I, I think, Margo, there are some places we can point to where there, there is a deep commitment to housing first that cuts across party lines in many cases, and that is really working at a community-wide level. Uh, I was in Houston not long ago, and that community committed 15 years ago all in on housing first and has stayed the course and has seen a dramatic reduction in homelessness. Milwaukee ad addressed encampments in their downtown area through a housing first approach that was supported by the business community, the faith community, the city and county government, the sheriff's department, everybody all in. Washington, D.C., my adopted hometown, is seeing excellent reductions in homelessness. There are still problems. There's still uh, some encampments that need to be dealt with. There's still work to be done, but it is working. So I think it's the individual stories, but it's also the stories of community success. Um, Andre, I just want to just say, like, based on what we're all talking about, like, yeah, these things happen all the time. People fall through the cracks, but uh, the funding's there, uh, not all the time, but you say you had some funding. One of the things I would say is this is why I tell folks, like, big part of the solution is everyone needs to support ELI housing, like everyone. Housing first, ELI housing, if you're not supporting that, then you're being a part of the problem, honestly. Like, that is a big solution. We need to go to the mayor, all the leaders in our county, and we need to create more financial opportunities to develop ELI housing. And we need people. People power is going to move our political power to do something. Yeah, I, I agree with that, Dante. I just wanted to, and I know we're getting, we want to get to another question, but I just wanted to lift up the fact that part of the, the fundamental challenge we have is that housing has been a commodity since the inception of this country. We have not seen it as a, a foundational necessity like uh, food, health care, <laughs> education. And so there is a worthiness perception of who is worthy of housing. And regardless of whatever issues you bring to the table, every human being in this country, in this world, I would fashion to say, but certainly in the United States that is the most resourced nation on the planet should have housing. Homelessness is first and foremost a housing issue. I think we, Nick, maybe one more. Yeah, we have time for one more question. This will be the final question. And everybody, I know that we got a lot of questions submitted. Thank you so much for that. If we didn't get to your question, please let us know. You can contact us at info at sanjosespotlight.com or go straight to Destination Home and we can try to help you out there. As for this final question, um, how do we create incentives for housing developers to build affordable housing in areas that need and want redevelopment? That is such a great question. Who would like to answer that? I'll start because my answer is brief. And Jeff said this point that I want to lift up. Housing first doesn't mean housing only, nor does it mean that you can build the housing without the appropriate supportive services that you need. Housing developers actually benefit from building housing. They want to be able to operate their properties for the long term and have enough resources to pay for the, when the roof goes out, when so, you know, whatever's going on with the property, they need operating dollars and they want services to be able to provide to their tenants to make sure that those tenants can thrive. If we can do those things at scale and in, in parallel with each other, we will have the type of housing that we need for people who are experiencing homelessness or are housing insecure, and we can have it at scale. I'm going to just add to that a couple of things, Tamika. Um, one is, and I'll put this in the chat for folks, but the White House uh, last Monday released a series of strategies that the administration is taking on uh, speeding up and accelerating the pipeline of affordable housing. So there's some, for those of you who, are, who wanna be in the weeds on this, the link that I'll put in the chat has a lot of really good information on that. What I will say more broadly is that we've gotta think much more creatively. Uh, I was in Seattle a couple of weeks ago, walking downtown, seeing a ton of empty office space, just sitting around, just empty buildings, because everybody's working from home, because the tech companies have, to have created a flexible, work policies during and after the pandemic. And then I see folks living outside on the street. I see encampments under bridges and in parks. It does not make sense that we have any indoor space in this country and people sleeping outside. So I think we need to get much more creative about thinking of how we, how we do zoning, how we do redevelopment, 
how we think about a, a range of housing options. So it's not just one person per voucher per apartment, but maybe we're thinking about shared housing models and, and group settings. We're thinking about single room occupancy and more uh, kind of targeted efficiency apartments for folks. We need a whole range of stuff to make this work. Um, and uh, so, to, you know, take a look at the, the administration's work on the affordable housing pipeline that I put in the chat, but I think push your, your communities to think creatively and, and connect the dots between the, re, the, the just the craziness of people sleeping outside while we have indoor spaces where they can be safe. Uh, this has been such a rich discussion. It's been an honor to be with my friends and colleagues who I have so much admiration for today. And I know that uh, some folks are asking if this is re being recorded. It is. San Jose Spotlight will make it available, but Destination Home will also be sending it out next week in a newsletter recap. So if you are interested in getting that and you're not already receiving our newsletter, I'm hoping that the way to sign up for that is in the chat if you want to to sign up for that. And then uh, right before uh, we go, we wanna do 60 seconds each. Uh, each closing thought, whatever is top of mind, let's start Dante with you. Uh, account accountability is, is gonna be very important in how we move forward with creating solutions. We put a lot of accountability and responsibility on the consumer. And we also don't realize that we do have consumer fatigue or consumer burnout. At the end of the day, we all need to create solutions that are going to help uplift people, families, those with disabilities, those without. We need to be creating economic opportunities for folks and we can't do any of that without housing. Housing first is going to be something that is going to disrupt the cycle of generations after generations um, of poverty. You know, we need to really disrupt and that's what it's about for us, but we have to be rooted in accountability. We need to hold providers accountable. We need to hold our government elected officials accountable. We need to hold the federal government uh, accountable and even ourselves, even as consumers, we need to hold ourselves accountable. Accountability is one of the things that I see lacking most in this community, in this work, across the board and that's what i will say and i appreciate everyone being here and i really do love this robust conversation and peace and love to you all jeff i know everybody's tired uh, dante mentioned fatigue um, it has been a, a devastating couple of years many of you have lost friends and loved ones uh, many of you have experienced um, the pain and and uh, suffering of homelessness yourself or of uh, losing a loved one to COVID or, or other life events. Um, and, and often we haven't had the space to grieve what's happened in this nation and on this globe over the last couple of years because the crisis of homelessness is still in front of us. The crisis of the pandemic is still with us. Um, take care of each other. Take care of yourself. Find refuge in, in each other. Homelessness is a societal failing. We have failed. We, any, anyone who is on the street or in a shelter or in their vehicle or in an encampment tonight, we have failed them as a society. And to solve this, which I believe down to my toes that we can, to solve this, we need every aspect of society coming together. The federal, state, and local government officials and, and departments, people with lived experience of homelessness, service providers and outreach workers and advocates, the faith community, the corporate sector, philanthropy, academia, everybody has a role to play in this. That way we can shoulder the work where it's not, um, it's not just a few people trying to solve uh, one of our society's most uh, grievous failings. I wanna thank you all for everything you do out there listening uh, to us and, and this panel, you guys are amazing. It's been so nice to be with you all for the last hour and a half and Jen really, really nice job moderating this. Thanks, Jeff. Tamika, final word. Um, I, I love what's already been said. I guess I would just add, say yes to housing. Um, all types, anywhere, say yes. We need it. Don't question it. Don't give in to your concerns or worry about othering. Let's be a community of belonging. We all belong and we all, in order to belong, not just subsist, 
But to thrive, we have to have homes for everyone. And unless we can make way for that to happen, we are chasing our tails and we get frustrated about a problem that feels unsolvable, but it's because we're not bringing our creativity and imagination to read Des designing our society whereby everyone has a place to call home. Margo. Yeah, I'm into that. Say yes to housing and know that when our neighbors are housed, when our community is housed, we are all safer. We are all better. We're all going to thrive and that we know how to do this, right? We're going to need to talk to our federal representatives, talk to our local government, talk to our state government, talk to our friends and neighbors, and everyone needs to be part of the solution. Be the person who shows up at that zoning meeting and says yes to housing. Be the person who writes that letter to your congressperson and says, support expansion of housing choice vouchers, support investment in ELI housing. Be the person who says, actually, even people with mental health and substance use disorders deserve to be housed, can be housed, and will thrive, and we're all going to be better for doing it. And so believe in a better future make your actions towards that at our future, stick with the evidence, don't get distracted by the like, you know, other stuff going on and let's all work towards a better person, better future. And let's center, as Dante has said, um, better than anyone else could say, like let's center the voices, the concerns and the power of the people who've been through this because they are really our route to the answer. And if I could add two cents, I would say, if you hear people talking about homeless people in a way that is cruel, punishing, racist, or unjust, challenge them, ask them why they would do that and how that is helping. Uh, this wraps up our discussion. Such an honor to be with y'all and so grateful. Thank you, San Jose Spotlight for hosting us today. This is recorded. We will send it out. Spotlight will share it. And I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Thank you again. Thanks so much. Thank you for joining us.